evening and welcome to the earnings of you your tidbits into company financials and operational insights thank you for joining us as we broadcast from hampton studios in harare zimbabwe i'm even mabunda yo money man on the show we engage top echelon executives to get you up to speed with first hand information we also chat with the most competent analysts on the market and now joining us for conversation tonight is the chief Analyst for Equity Access, Respect Quincy. Respect, good evening and welcome to the Earnings Review. Thank you, Ibn. It's always my pleasure. Fantastic. Sure. Now, we have got um, a, an exciting program in store for you tonight as we get into the nitty gritties of two listed companies with outstanding and deep running issues. Those firms being, of course, Zeko Holdings Limited as well as Border Timbers. Now, for Zeko Holdings, this is, this is a firm that has been in perennial losses for several years, while Border Timbers is a firm that has been under judicial management and is currently Currently under suspension on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Now, to get started, we'll have a look at some of the operational issues that are playing out at Zeko Holdings. Zeko Holdings was initiated in the year 2007, which of course was the year of its establishment as well as incorporation. But just some details with regards to how the firm actually operates. This is a firm that manufactures as well as distributes rail wagons and locomotives for utilities that are distributed across Zambia, Tanzania, Mozambique, Ethiopia, as well as Kenya. The company also manufactures roller shutters, industrial, as well as agricultural equipment. In May of 2008, the firm went on to acquire all assets that were held by a firm known as the Cobalt Holdings Private Limited. Now, the firm currently has its shares trading at 0.02 cents and a market capitalization of 92,000 Zimbabwean dollars. The share price has pretty much remained state static since November of 2015 at that very paltry price of 0.02 cents. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, I've, I'm joined with Respect Quincy, who's going to give us detail with regards to the operations of the firm. Now, Respect, can you give us insight as well as the backdrop into where it is that this firm is actually coming from and some of the key issues that are playing out with Zeko Holdings Limited? Uh, thank you. So uh, Zeko Holdings is one of those few companies that are on the listed company which has been a perennial uh, loss-making entity. Uh, the backdrop there is that the company has failed to re it has failed to reconfigure even as the economy moved from that 2008 uh, crisis. So, I mean, in, the, in those first years after the 2008 crisis, most companies invested in capitalization, that is retooling, retooling their businesses, bringing in new technology and so forth. And for an engineering firm such as, um, such as Zeko, uh, they should have obviously automated their processes and uh, capitalized their operations even through also working capital. So they failed to do that. And um, obviously it also borders on the aspect of uh, shareholding and uh, the, 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 the aspects of, 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 of management as well. So um, it has remained generally a loss-making entity up to 2020. And this is reflected by a share price, which obviously is very, very uh, small. And even if you look at the overall market cap at 92,000 in, in real US dollars, that's really a very powerful figure of under $100. Interesting. Can you give us insight as to what this share price movement actually means? Because, I mean, this is a share price that's been static um, for a period of roughly five years. What does that speak in terms of the investor sentiment where the operations of Zeko are concerned? I think it generally just reflects that there's no investor appetite for the shares. It, it shows that the market has completely lost interest uh, in, in, in the company. But also, I think it, it's, uh, it's a call for the regulators to obviously try to relook at the key matrices that determine, um, I mean, the levels at which a company should be eligible for, for listing. You should really look at the turnover levels, you should really look at the profitability levels and so forth. And these are some of the key issues there because even the cost of listing is far much higher than its own market cap. So I think this is really some serious cause for concern for both uh, shareholders, the, the, the investing public, as well as even the regulator themselves. Um, let's 
take a moment to get into their financials, particularly 2018 into 2019. In 2018, the company reported a loss um, of 11.6 million Zimbabwean dollars. In 2019, a loss of 1.9 million Zimbabwean dollars. This, of course, is in inflation adjusted terms. This is besides the series of losses that have been posted prior to these two years. What can we read from the performance of the firm? And perhaps what insight could you give us, and of course to those who are joining us on our platforms, in terms of what could be actually taking place within the management structures? Of course, I know that Dr. Philip Chiangwa, um, a renowned businessman here in Zimbabwe, is actually the chair, board chair for this very firm. Over to you. Yes, of course. Yes. So Chiangwa actually owns the company and has been uh, obviously overseeing uh, management of the, of the company in his, um, in his role as the chairman over the past at least 10 years. So I, I think that there are obviously fundamental challenges in terms of how the organization is being run. You cannot make um, sustainable losses over a period of 10 years and still expect investors to take you uh, serious. So I think um, obviously there has been a challenge around that. But like I said, engineering business is it's a high capital capitalization business. It, it demands companies to chip in um, high levels of capitalization. And when you look at Zeco, they've been posting perennial losses, and these losses feed into negative cash flow. And when you have negative cash flow, you can't sustain your working capital demands. You can't also even imagine investing in, 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 in pure capital uh, projects such as those that would demand uh, a hefty uh, uh, packages. So I think that uh, the challenge is really speak to a lack of capitalization, a lack of um, um, a focused management, and uh, also even a shareholder push as well. And this is what is culminated into this uh, um, sustained uh, loss position. But I think looking at the 2019 and 2018 numbers, I think the 2018 number there is also even in USD, in USD, um, in, 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 in USD, which simply means we are coming from a dollarized period into a de-dollarized period. And so obviously there was that switch really to call a 2018 number a ZWL, but in essence it was really a, a, a USD number. So that's a really a huge loss in 2018, but it's also coming from the fact that there are no sufficient sales, there's no uh, proper working capital, but into 2019, you have got a number of factors kicking in. You've got fair value losses. You also have got, um, um, uh, I mean, uh, depreciation that's actually coming out of net foreign dates. So all, all those things militate to give you a negative outturn in profit terms. Now, um, this is also a firm that manufactures rail wagons. What's the relationship between Zeco and uh, the National Railways uh, of Zimbabwe? Could it be that perhaps the fact that NRZ is not performing at its optimum, this could also have a trickling down effect as far as Zeco is concerned? I think that's a very uh, interesting observation there. But when you look at the NRZ uh, over the past at least uh, 20 years, They've rarely also invested in, in new wagons. We only uh, saw a, a bit of a movement in 20, 20, 20, 2019 to 2020 when um, uh, NRZ had to get into deals with some local um, investors, I mean some investors who are uh, from Zimbabwe but based in South Africa who had to bring in some bit of investment that is procuring wagons from South Africa. But all that also means when you don't have a functional uh, rail system and, and, and obviously a, a regulator in that respect, it also means the investment that, can, that should accrue uh, to all other sectors that feed into, 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 into that space, obviously it, it, it becomes low. So for, for Zeco really, they have really faced that challenge but also they have not been adequately capitalized to really offer those services. Suffice to say that, of course, yes, NRZ did not have um, a running uh, railway line to really uh, think or imagine, uh, I mean, importation or even procuring of some of these um, wagons from Zeco. Now, 
this would be perhaps a question that would not be a common one on, 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 on our uh, normal discussions, but of interest would be, at what point really does the ZSE then make the decision um, to say we are going to have to do away with this very counter? I know, of course, there's suspensions and delistings, but should Z um, ZECO continue to be on the ZSE? If so, for how long? And what then becomes the turning point should things not change from an operational perspective? Yeah, uh, so when you look at the aspect of uh, listing, it has got its own, there are listing regulations or listing rules that are already prescribed. You are looking at key matrices, the uh, biggest factor there being the turnover levels. You have to achieve a certain turnover level in order to um, attract a, a listing on the ZSE. So suppose your turnover becomes low when you finally get the listing. Uh, obviously you won't necessarily be uh, taken off the board but it's it's now a discretion for shareholders to decide whether they should uh, keep on the company uh, on the boss or they should uh, move a motion to uh, get the company uh, removed from the board so I think for 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 Zeko, I mean for instance if you look at a company like Tesla in America, that company has been listed for over five years, but they have not posted a profit to debt. But there has been that gradual uh, uh, reduction in the level at which the, 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 their losses are, are, are moving. So I think that in the same vein, you are seeing a company which is called Zeco. It's, it, it's listed, it starts uh, posting a huge turnover, then that starts depleting to a certain point, it's below the threshold that's required by the ZSC. Obviously, um, of course, over the past one or so years, there have been alterations in those numbers, but uh, you can't, be, uh, you can't um, attract a listing when you have a turnover of less than 250,000 per annum. Um, let's suppose for a moment that you are installed as the new uh, managing director for Zeco Holdings. Which direction would you take the institution and what sort of changes would you implement to turn the fortunes around for this firm? I think the key thing there is uh, restructuring the entity when you have limited resources at your disposal, you obviously try to, to streamline your operations. It means you have to really look at the um, a key focus area. What are we competitive at? You have to dispose of other entities, generate a bit of uh, income from there, capitalize that streamlined business, uh, uh, also relieve uh, some a workforce which is not as necessary but i think key to that issue is really having a clear backing from the shareholder uh, side of things you really have to have a shareholder who is eager to put in uh, uh, capital into the business who also allows you to uh, retain entities that matter and dispose of entities that do not i really think that uh, the broader uh, zeco holdings uh, is, is, is too bloated they really have to streamline the operations uh, they really have to focus on maybe one key area and obviously that might mitigate the losses. Now that there have not been any major changes up to this point, what can we expect from this film over, over the next two to three years? Just very quickly before we take a break. I think that uh, reading from the sentiment, I, I think uh, Zeco really is now a shell company. It's, it's now being retained on the, on the ZSC possibly for other reasons other than for uh, trying to solicit capital flows from shareholders. So I, I really don't expect that there could be a turnaround in terms of fortunes. I think we will sustainably see the company going down and eventually it's delisting. So uh, there might be other reasons why its shareholders are still retaining, um, I mean, uh, the preference for listing on the ZSE. Oh, thank you, respect. We're just going to take a break. When we come back, we will get into the team three NCs of the operations for Border Timbers. Don't go anywhere. Equity Life presents the complete online interactive presentation solution. Hosting AGMs, media, and analyst briefings has never been this simple, efficient, and affordable. Communicate globally through a combination of high definition video and your prepared multimedia presentation from any location of your choice. Interact with your invited participants from all over the world in question and answer sessions and voting sessions in real time on our safe, secure and affordable platform. Contact Equity Live for a free customized demonstration. Equity Live, real time presentation solutions.
Thank you for staying with us. Now in this segment, we get into the operational details of Border Timbers. And now, of course, still with me on set is the Chief Analyst for Equity Access, Respect Quenzi. In the previous segment, we were looking at the operations of Zeko Holdings. And now we uh, get to look into Border Timbers, which is a listed firm um, whose shares have been suspended from the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. But Respect, before we can get into conversation, just some interesting details perhaps to take note of and as well to give some form of a backdrop. This is a firm that was established in 1945 as a forestry as well as saw milling company here in Zimbabwe, of course, in the then southern Rhodesia. The firm went on to list on the local boards now referred to as the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange in 1959. The company operates five forest estates as well as three sawmills and is one of the biggest contributors to the timber industry, not just in Zimbabwe, but also for the export market. Now, there are some out outstanding running uh, issues that have been running deep over the past several years dating back to the land reform program where there have been issues to do with land tenure with local farmers there claiming portions of land that Border Timbers had been using for its operational activities. Now these issues have run for over a decade culminating into the firm being placed under judicial management as well as some issues to do with a six million US dollar debt that is owed to the firm's creditor. The firm has had to be suspended from the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange in the year 2018 following a failure to meet publication deadlines and as far as the Zimbabwe stock exchange is concerned now respect this of course would pretty much from the backdrop but from an analysis perspective what would be your insight into the issues that form the crux the epicenter of this very quake that continues to be devil border timbers yeah it's it's really a sad story they're looking at um obviously uh, part of their land which uh, obviously has been partially or almost compulsorily acquired by, by the government. And obviously there are some people who are claiming that this land belongs to them. But there's been an arbitration uh, in an international court which has proven that that land really belongs to them and they have to uh, get their land returned to them. But uh, the operational impact of that is that it has resulted in lower production, it has resulted in um, sustained uh, losses as well at the, at the company. So they've really refocused, they've um, tried to look at the land at which uh, the land which they still have control over, uh, trying to see the mix there uh, between um, the categories of products that they manufacture, that, that they produce. And uh, obviously, looking at the numbers over the past few years, they have progressively been improving. So really, I think one sticky issue there which uh, retains their, their, their uh, judicial management status is uh, the issue around uh, the land which uh, is in dispute. But um, as, a, as an entity, I think that they are slowly moving and they're almost turning the corner and looking at the latest numbers over the past uh, year or so, uh, definitely it shows that there's some positive uh, indications coming from the company. I'm talking about the numbers there, an interesting point that you're actually raising. Um, a quick look into their operational performance um, over the 12 months to the 30th of June 2018. The firm went on to post um, revenue to the tune of $38 million uh, there, as well as a loss of $12 million. Um, in the nine months to uh, the 31st of March 2019, a profit before tax of $3.4 million Zimbabwean dollars. Then you cross all over into 2020, where there's actually been a loss of eight, uh, 877,000 vis a vis a revenue of 181 million Zimbabwean dollars. Just in a nutshell, what can we actually draw out from that very performance, um, as well as perhaps some of the underlying issues that we have played out with Border Timbers? Yeah, so obviously, that 2018 figure is really reflective of growth uh, and also getting into 2019 for the nine months. And then when you compare that to 2020, we are seeing that we are currently in a lost position. Uh, why do we have a lost position in, that, in, in, the, in the latest period? Uh, this is really a culmination of that foreign currency debt which they um, carry on their books. So they, they really have um, outstanding obligations which when converted 
to Zim dollar actually reflects a loss on their part. So that, that, that's what has been driving the net uh, profit position back into the negative. But I think when you look at the top line, there has been a steady growth, although in the current, um, in the current period, there was obviously the impact of COVID. Um, obviously, you, 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 you would understand that under COVID, um, companies have been failing to move uh, goods uh, swiftly beyond borders. There have been these supply chain issues. And so it also affected uh, especially their export market and even local demand as well in some of their lines. So this, this, this had an impact in terms of their uh, volume, sales volume performance. But I think when you look at um, their key line, uh, their key line, their production was up improved efficiencies but the demand was not really sufficient to drive their net sales performance beyond i mean beyond uh, the prior comparable nine months period now um earlier i had a conversation with uh, peter bailey who is the judicial manager for um that uh, business unit and uh, he actually gave a timeline in terms of when they expected to have been taken out of the judicial management and the stipulated period or should i say the indicated so to say was roughly around march of 2019 but this is uh, almost six months since that very period that mr bailey actually alluded to what could be happening behind the scenes there or what could be uh, the key factors uh, resulting in you know the delay of you yeah know, that. so there's only one key determinant which comes into play in terms of the company um, either remaining under judicial management or not uh, the key factor there is um, how the land issue is dealt uh, I mean, how it is dealt like. So that's that's the only outstanding thing. And they mentioned in their latest uh, trading update that until uh, we have a clear indication or until this issue is dealt with decisively, uh, the company will remain under judicial management. So I think, um, obviously, uh, we, we, we still have to have government coming to the table, uh, the, 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 the disputees or... Uh, those who say the land is there, they have to the parties who, who, who believe so, they have to come on, um, into the table and also uh, border timbers. So I think the, the three-way discussion has not gone on and uh, it's obviously prolonging the, the, the process to retain the land. But um, like I said, there has been an international arbitration which uh, went into effect a few years ago and it spelled out clearly that the land really should be retained or belongs to our border timbers. So government has to bring the parties together and finalize the issue. And so until then, the company will remain under a judicial management. And obviously the firm needs to recapitalize, they need more investment and all of that. But while they're under suspension, that becomes very much a sticking point. How can they turn that suspension around of course they are the ones that actually made the application way back in 2018 but how then can that can that be reversed and could there be an anticipated period at which perhaps we can expect them to come out of this suspension to allow them to source more investment from the investor community yeah it's very difficult for a company that's trading under judicial management to um obviously um, I mean, a uh, request to lift uh, its the suspension. suspension. Okay. Uh, why? Because whenever a company is under judicial management, it means the fundamental underlying uh, things that might um, either sink the company or uh, bring it back to life. So you're really on the edge. And uh, trading in shares can be highly speculative. Sometimes you allow a company to get back to trading and all of a sudden it, it collapses or maybe it, you allow it to go back to trading and all of a sudden uh, somebody has made a million in a day. So I think it's also in the best interest of shareholders uh, to uh, keep uh, its current status uh, is under suspension just to protect uh, shareholders and to reduce speculative bets on the counter. So I don't really think that uh, we're likely to see any lifting of the suspension before uh, the company is uh, released from uh, judicial management. Um, now let's talk about the potential of this very firm um, 
excusing these outstanding issues for a moment. Um, this is a firm that is heavily invested in agriculture, that also has um, inroads into the export market. They add value to the timber that, it, that they actually produce here, and they're able to reach into the export market, South Korea, and all of those places. What growth prospects exist from an operational perspective for border timbers? Uh, the aspect of uh, regional demand, I think it's, 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 it's quite um, dominant there. Uh, they've been able to grow their exports into the region quite phenomenally over the past few years. So it really speaks into the aspect of logistics, um, how you are able to trade uh, between borders more efficiently, how you are able to also produce more efficiently. If you look at their uh, uh, plantations and some of their sawmills, uh, where they process some of this timber, they rightly positioned one in an area where they have three of their key farms that's in the Chimanimani area, and then you have another one positioned uh, in the Penalonga area, and of course, as of recent as well, in, in, in Palmerstone, that's in the, in the heart of Mutari. Um, so I think this reduces um, um, uh, the process or the, the, the time it takes, or even the cost it takes from bringing the uh, um, produce from uh, the ground into the into the mill or into the plant, and then of course taking it off to the to the export market. So you you have a, a, a production process that's becoming highly efficient. You also have a route to market or route to uh, plant which is actually closer and also more efficient and this makes the produce more competitive. If you look at the lumber numbers there, they, they, they've been consistently growing. Correct. Oh, of course, yes, we have got the poor side, uh, which, which, which really is, is, is a bit shaky, but also uh, uh, providing something for the entity. So I really think that they are positioned and the business really is, um, is, is almost on a solid footing by the suspension. So they really have got um, um, good prospects going into the future. The ability to earn foreign currency as well is a positive for the company. Uh, they also have a strong uh, parent in Rift Valley, which I also think is, is a good factor given uh, the current suspension. I mean, the key shareholder, they can always come in and chip in, uh, bring in capital where it's needed, working capital and even capitalization in some in some ways. So I really think that they are really positioned as, as, as an entity. Now, as we round up respect, there was an outstanding issue of a for an obligation to the tune of six million dollars which according to mr peter bailey um was nearing uh its repayment if not if that has not actually taken place now with you know a solid footing as you rightly pointed out what can we expect from the firm perhaps in the next two to three years yeah obviously that debt is uh, is, is a bit of a time bomb but then the company is producing, it's also uh, reporting profit, pro, pro, profit in, in some instances. So I really think that there's room to cover uh, partially uh, that date. Uh, they could as well even ask for a restructuring, given that they have got these uh, hanging issues there. Uh, creditors uh, sometimes have that uh, right to also, I mean, uh, help entities that are struggling, given that they would have had a working relationship over the past uh, yes, so I, I, I think that that loan can be restructured. Um, the company can also partially settle it. But um, in terms of the outlook, I really think uh, the company is, is, is positioned for growth. There's less local competition. Of course, in the region, yes, there's a, a bit of competition, but the regional market has been growing. And so I really think over the next two years, uh, they could redeem themselves and position themselves on a, on a sustainable uh, profitability path. Well, thank you, Respect, for the insights. It was a pleasure having to be in conversation with you. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and to visit our informative website, www.equityaccess.net. Remember to visit us every Tuesday from the Equity Access team and I, Dan Kian. Ciao.